Well, good evening, church. Good to be with you once again on this Wednesday evening as we continue our study in the book of Ecclesiastes. So turn with me to Ecclesiastes chapter 6. Uh, before we do that, before we get into the study, you can go ahead and be turning there, but uh, let me just remind you, you should uh, have a phone blast and also on our Facebook page and also announced uh, this coming Sunday. Next Wednesday, next Wednesday, October 14th, one week from today, uh, we will resume our Wednesday night adult Bible study on campus. And so we will have it in the sanctuary. We're not going to do it at the fellowship hall. We're going to do it in the sanctuary Wednesday night, starting October 14th in the sanctuary that'll give us opportunity to spread out uh, be socially distanced on wednesday night also it also allows us to use the fm transmitter so if you don't feel that you can come into the building you can do just like on sunday morning it will be broadcast into the parking lot on wednesday nights on 92.7 fm also it will be video recorded so uh, if you're still uh, feeling like you need to be in quarantine because of uh, sickness or just poor health we want to continue to give you a, a video, and so it will be a video of the service on Wednesday night in the sanctuary. It'll be uploaded on Thursday mornings, and it'll be available sometime mid-morning on Thursday. So starting next Wednesday night, uh, October 14th, 7 p.m., we will meet in the sanctuary or in the parking lot, or you can watch the video on Thursday mornings. Okay, so just I'm, I'm excited about that. Hopefully, this is the last time we'll have to do this. And, um, and so as, as the continues, the numbers of COVID continue to decline. It looks like we're coming out of this. Hopefully there's not a resurgence in the future. So we'll continue to pray that the Lord continues to, to uh, direct us in the right direction here. So, uh, so anyway, going into Ecclesiastes, uh, chapter six, verse 10 through chapter seven, verse 14 is where we're going to be at six, 10 through seven, 14. And this passage is, it's one passage. It spans two chapters, but there again, um, you know, this is, uh, there's one thought process that is going into this set of verses. That is the sovereignty of God. That's the overarching theme of these passages is the uh, the sovereignty of God. Now it's really laid out, and here's how it's laid out, this passage. Um, you have a prologue. In other words, you have an introduction to a topic, if you will, an introduction to an idea, and that's verses uh, 10, and 10 through 12 of chapter 6, the prologue. Then you have some proverbs. You have some wise sayings that Solomon has for us in chapter 7, verses 1 through 12, and then you have an epilogue or a conclusion uh, in verses 13 and 14 of chapter 7. So you have a prologue, some, some uh, passages, some proverbs, some wisdom, and then an epilogue or a conclusion, okay? And so th what we see is we're seeing a kind of a transformation of how Solomon is speaking to us. Remember, he's the teacher. He's the preacher. We're the ones that are gathered. And so he's speaking to the gathered ones, right? And so uh, the first part, uh, he's of uh, the book of Ecclesiastes. He's really shown us his own folly, his own vanity, what he tried to learn, what he tried to do, and, and how that turned out for him, trying to live life under the sun. Well, now he's beginning to give us the wisdom. So here's, he's coming, you know, if you will, if you're following the story of his life, he's come to his senses, he's learned from his folly and his vanity, and now he's beginning to give us the wisdom, right? So uh, this is the wisdom part, if you will. It's all been wisdom, but he's really getting to uh, just uh, without, uh, you know, having to, to really decipher what he's trying to say. He kind of lays it out there. Now then, there again, it is kind of tricky wording because uh, how he's using this is uh, 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 this is uh, literature. Um, he's uh, he's giving it to us in a form that is uh, poetic, if you will, especially in the Hebrew. It's very poetic. And uh, so we have to discern and see what is there. So let's pray for the Lord's discernment as we uh, gather together and study this passage. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to be together. Lord, we just pray for uh, your Holy Spirit to speak to our hearts, Lord, that we may understand these words, discern them, glorify you in them, and Lord, that we would be changed by them. Lord, we thank you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right. Talking about the sovereignty of God. That's what this is the main focus of what this passage is about. Um, the sovereignty of God. And we could spend a long time talking about the sovereignty of God. So let me just give you a quick, simple definition, a couple of illustrations, right? The sovereignty of God means that God is sovereign or he is king. He is Lord uh, of all, all of his creation, all of the universe, every human being, everything that's ever been created. God rules and reigns over those creations, right? And so that is God's sovereign. We use uh, the word sovereign as a nation. We are a sovereign nation. In other words, we don't answer to anybody else. We control our own uh, policies, our own laws, uh, those types of things. As the United States, we don't look to Great Britain or to England or any other country and say, well, how should we do this? We may get advice, 
but we don't they don't rule over us. We are sovereign. We are self ruled. Right. And so uh, the sovereignty of God is, is that he is the ruler. There is no one higher than him. He does not answer to anyone else. He has total control over all of his creation uh, and total rule. So and here's some, some more illustrations. Now, obviously, all earthly illustrations fall short to some degree. But uh, to kind of give you some help and some idea of understanding the sovereignty. Uh, we are sovereign uh, as parents, right? Uh, a child is born. And uh, we are we have sovereign control over there. A child cannot make a decision of uh, what time he wants to go to bed or when he wants to eat. Right. He is totally dependent on us. He or she totally dependent on us. Now, then, um, sometimes we do things that the child doesn't like. All right. But we know what's best for the child. And so therefore, our sovereignty over this child, our rule over this child takes them to the doctor and they may get shots. Right. For chicken pox or measles or whatever the sh shots that kids get these days. Right. It hurts. The child screams and the child cries and it doesn't understand why in the world you as a parent took me to this man or this woman in a cold room and they stuck this uh, needle in me and hurt me. That hurt. Well, we understand as sovereign parents that this is what's good for the child. And so that's the, the, the part of a sovereignty picture that we have of God. One of the reasons why we struggle with God's sovereignty, and I say we struggle with it. So, you know, in, in theory, we don't. But when something happens that we don't like, then we struggle with the sovereignty of God. If we have a child that dies, uh, God, why did you allow this to happen? Well, God is sovereign. He's sovereign over life. He's sovereign over that child. That doesn't mean that God caused its death. It means that God allowed its death, right? Um, there, again, there again, let me use a, an earthly illustration. As, a, as a, you may be a, a child and you have an elderly parent, and this parent has suffered a stroke or a heart attack or a brain injury of some sort, and they're there on life support. Right. And if you have power of attorney, uh, then you have sovereign control over when they pull the plug. The doctors will come to you and say, do you want us to continue treatment or not? Well, you have sovereign rule over that person at that time. You may say um, the doctors say there's really no hope. There's no brain activity, so on and so forth. Our suggestion is, is that we remove life support, see if they can sustain it. You agree. You make a sovereign decision to remove life support and the person dies. Now, did you cause their death? No, absolutely not. But yet you had uh, your sovereign decision uh, was a part of uh, the fact that they were now deceased. Right. It wasn't your fault. You didn't kill them. You're not going to be prosecuted in, in the courts as long as you had power of attorney. <laughs> you had the right authority to do those things there again. God does not cause the death necessarily, but he is ruler over the death, right? We struggle with that. Why do we struggle with that? Because we want to be sovereign. We want to have all the control. We won't, don't like someone else having the control over us. It's part of growing up, right? As a child, your parents tell you when to go to bed, where to go to school, what to wear, what you're going to eat, so on and so forth. And so you get to a certain point in life where as an adult, you can make those decisions for yourself. You leave the home. You decide what job you're going to have, what school you go to, uh, what clothes you're going to wear, what you're going to eat, what, what movies you're going to see, those types of things. You make a sovereign choice because now you are on your own, right? At the age of 45 years old, I don't call my mom and say, mom, what am I having for supper tonight? Right? That's, that's my own decision. Um, I'm sovereign over that. And so we are growing up. And we come to a point to where we want and we desire and, and, and as a part, it is good to have your own sovereignty, right? It's not good to rely on your parents when you're 45 years old unless there's other outlying issues, right? And so that's a part of it. But here's the thing is that as humans, we are not the top of the chain. We are the pinnacle of God's creation, but we are not God ourselves. He is over us. And that's something that we struggle with. There again, when things happen that we don't understand, then we struggle with God's sovereignty. And so, but here's the thing is that the essence of our faith is understanding that God's sovereignty is pointing and is actually not just pointing to, it is an essence of his love for us. And so God, we have to have a faith that everything that God does is for our good, whether we know it or not, whether we see it or not, just like a child getting a shot. It may hurt, may not understand it, it may sting, but you know what? It is for your good. And because as a parent, you understand more than the child does. As God, he understands and he knows more than we do, right? So there again, the sovereignty of God is a good thing. But how do we live among uh, uh, in that? That's part of what Solomon is going to say in today's uh, uh, study. So talking about the sovereignty of God and how we live in the midst of the sovereignty of God. And so looking at a couple of things, here's the prologue. Here's the introduction. 
Uh, verse 10 and 11 is the first thing. He says, whatever has come to be has already been named, right? So he talks about this already been named. Um, that's ta he's talking about the sovereignty of God. When you name something, right? Um, if you get a dog, if you go and uh, you know purchase or you go to the pound or whatever and you get a, a dog, right? And you have this dog and maybe if you get it from certain things, they, it comes with a name, but most likely not. Or if it did come with a name, you probably will change it, right? Unless the dog has really become accustomed to that name. But if it's a puppy, you know, newborn puppy is eight weeks or however long, how old they have to be before they can leave their mother. You get this puppy, you do what? You name the the dog, right? You don't wait until the dog gets older and you sit down and have a discussion with the dog and say, what, what would you like to be called? No, you name that dog because you're sovereign over that dog, right? That's dog is reliant on you. It is your dog. It's your possession, right? Same thing with a boat. Uh, he has, many people name their boats, right? Some people name their cars, right? So it's, a, it's an act of sovereignty over something is by naming it. Same thing with a child. We name our children. We don't ask them. We don't wait till they get old enough and say, what would you like to be named? No, in all of the Bible, in all of scripture, naming is a part of the sovereignty over and a description of that person, right? And so it says, whatever has come to be has already been named. Well, who's doing the naming? Not you and I, it's God. God is the one who is sovereign over all things. God knows and he controls all things. And it says, goes on, and it is known what man is. Whoa, there you go. And it's the heart of man. God knows who we are before we were ever born. So there again, it's God's sovereignty is what he's pointing to. And that he is not able to dispute with one stronger than he. I mean, it's just Solomon saying, look, God's named everything. He's already He already knows everything that's going to take place. He's sovereign over all of it. He knows who we are before we're ever born, and there's no use arguing with him, right? He is the one who is stronger than us. He knows more. He knows all things. He is stronger than us. He is infinitely strong. He is creator. He's the one who's created us. So we don't argue with him. There's no sense arguing with God because he is the one who is in control. He's sovereign. He goes on to verse 11, the more words, the more vanity. And what is the advantage to man? In other words, he's saying, well, why argue with God, right? We may not be pleased with God. No, he's not saying we shouldn't uh, voice our concerns with God. That's not what he's saying. He's saying you shouldn't reject God. Turn your back on God. Say, I know better. You should not have taken my mother or my child or my best friend. Uh, you are a bad God. Who are you? How do you know? You're not sovereign. You don't know these things. God named all the events that would take place. He knows each and every individual. He knows their life. He knows their future. He knows everything about them. He is stronger and more wise and more powerful than we. And so who are we to multiplicity of words? It's all vanity. Why? Because, you know, there again, do you see a child arguing with his parent about the shots? No. The parent knows what needs to take place, right? And so the more words, the more vanity. And what is the advantage to man? There's no advantage to that. There again, this doesn't mean we don't go to God and cry out to him and lament to him about the death of someone and say, Lord, why? And maybe God will give you some answers in time. But here's the thing. He doesn't have to. He's sovereign. There again, we don't like that. <laughs> Matter of fact, it goes back to the Garden of Eden. Why did Adam and Eve choose to eat of the, fr the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? Because they wanted to be sovereign. They understood that God had total control of it. Eat of this tree, don't eat of that one. Do this, don't do that. I'm sovereign. I know what's going to take place. I know what's going to happen if you eat of this tree. Well, they didn't believe him. They wanted to be their own sovereign gods, and they wanted to be have total control of their life. Well, don't tell me what to eat and what not to eat. I'll eat what I want to. Well, we are all paying the price. So when Solomon is writing this, remember the, the Genesis chapter three is all over the book of Ecclesiastes and the ramifications of our desire to be sovereign, that we want to have control, total control of our lives and not live under the rule and reign of God. Well, to be God's children, just like an earthly child, just like a human child, we need to be listening to and understanding the sovereignty of the one who is over us. We are just like an infant. We don't know. We don't know. We don't, we don't know what we need. We don't know what is best for us. We just know that what we see around us, right? And so God is the one who sees the big picture. That's what, what Solomon is trying to get to. Warren Wearsby said this. He said, the will of God or the sovereignty of God comes from the heart of God and is an expression of the love of God. What God wills for us is best for us because he knows far more about us than we do. You and I may not understand how God exercises his freedom, but it isn't necessary for us to know all. Our greatest freedom 
comes when we are lovingly lost in the will of God. Let me repeat that last part. Our greatest freedom comes when we are lovingly lost in the will of God. I mean, think about that. Think of Adam and Eve. If they were lovingly lost in the will of God, God said, don't eat of that tree. And if they would listen to God and lovingly lived and being lost in the will of God, lovingly living in the will of God and saying, you know what? I'm not going anywhere near that tree. How much freedom would they have? They would have, I mean, infinite freedom to, to walk with God, talk with God, live with God, uh, praise God, worship God. Think of their children, their grandchildren. Think of us today. We wouldn't have all this situation we're going on today. How much freedom would we have? Oh, man, that's where the freedom really is. But in our own wicked hearts, we say, no, God doesn't know what's best for me. I know what's best for me. I want to live my life, and God has no say-so in what I do and what I say. Well, the reality is, whether you like it or not, whether you're saved or not, God has total, complete sovereign over everything in his universe. And so there's, again, we, we do understand that it's good to be in the will of God, to be in the will of a sovereign God who has our, our best interest at heart. There again, it's like a shot into an infant. It may sting, it may hurt, it may not understand what's going on, but God does. And we have to trust him. That's part of faith. It's part of living by faith. It's living in the, in the faith of the will and the sovereignty of God. So he goes on there. Um, he says, verse 12, it's kind of these are rhetorical questions. For who knows what is good for man while he lives the few days of his vain life, which he passes like a shadow? For who can tell man what will be after him under the sun? There again, you don't know the future. You don't know what's going on. You and I don't know. Um, his, the rhetorical question is only God knows because he asked a question for who knows what is good for man while he lives his life on these very few days. Who knows? Well, God does. God is the one who is in control. God is the one who is loving, who is caring for you and uh, has demonstrated that over and over through his grace and his mercy and through Jesus Christ on the cross. He's given us a, an opportunity for salvation. Uh, that's God's will. It's God's sovereign design. It. His, his son would die. Jesus was, was not a last minute uh, uh, just attempt to try to save people. Jesus knew uh, he was going to die. It was part of the plan. It's part of his sovereign plan. His death, his, his hurt, his, his uh, being beaten and, and tortured was a part of his sovereign plan. So God knows hurt. Jesus knows what it is to be rejected, to be hurt, to be uh, to, to experience death. And the Father knows what it is to experience loss. And so there's nothing that we go through that Jesus and God does not know how it feels. And so there again, it doesn't mean that he uh, just doesn't care. It means that he understands what is best, even though it may hurt. All right. And so there again is, is he's pointing to Solomon in these first few verses. He's pointing to as a prologue. Hey, here's the sovereignty of God. We got to live within this understanding that we don't know everything, that God is sovereign and he has our best interest at heart. All right. So now then we get into the Proverbs, the wisdom sayings that he's going to give us here. And so there again, if God is sovereign, how do we live? How are we to live this life? Well, obviously Solomon is not going to give us everything in every aspect of, of life, but here's the, here's the topics that he does give. Here's what's on his heart and his mind is being led by the Holy Spirit to give us these things. So the first thing is this. The first set of verses talks about being wise when you're considering death and the brevity of life. All right, Be wise when it comes to things of, of life and death. Here's some verses. Look at verses one through four. A good name is better than precious ointment and the day of death and the day of birth. It is better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting. For this is the end of all mankind, and the, li and the living will lay it, uh, lay it to heart. Sorrow is better than laughter, for by sadness of face the heart is made glad. The heart of the wise is, the, is in the house of mourning, but the heart of fools is in the house of mirth, or celery, or foolishness, if you will. Uh, foolish fun uh, is what it's talking about there with mirth. Um, so what is he saying here? I mean, this sounds really weird, right? I mean, it sounds really weird. Well, first of all, we got to understand he's saying something in here. He says, a good name is better than. It's better than. He says this several times. It is better, verse 2. It is better. Uh, verse 3, sorrow is better. So he's giving this this contradiction, if you will. It's better. Now that our, our minds usually go, for, when we say better, we assume that the two polar opposites, good and bad, right? So this is good, this is bad. And so if you apply that thinking, good and bad, to the second part, the day of death is better than the day of birth. You're thinking, okay, the day of death is better than, so the death is good and birth is bad. 
No, that's not what he's saying. All right. We, there again, our minds go to good and evil, right? Well, two polar opposites. But when he's saying better than, there's some things that are good, but there's something better, right? Um, you get two job uh, offers, right? Uh, say you're an accountant. And so you're going to go work for an accounting firm and you have two, uh, two firms that are wanting uh, to hire you. Right. One of them is offering. I don't know how much accountants make. Uh, let's just uh, throw some numbers out there. One, the first accountant firm offers you one hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year salary plus benefits. Right. One hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year. That's really good money. Right. Well, you go to the next offer and they offer you uh, three hundred thousand dollars a year, twice as much. Well, the hundred and fifty thousand is not bad. Right. I mean, people at McDonald's are not making one hundred fifty thousand a year. So one hundred and fifty thousand salary is good. But 300,000 is better, right? So it's not good and evil, it's better than. It's better than. So I'll give you an illustration in, in scripture. When Jesus in John chapter 11, we're going to be there in a couple of weeks uh, on Sunday morning, John chapter 11, the death of Lazarus, right? Lazarus dies, and Jesus says, It is good that I was not there. Now we can paraphrase that as Jesus is saying, It's better that I was not there. You go, Well, wait a second. What is Jesus saying? It's better to die? No, what Jesus is saying, he knew the sovereign will of God. Remember the sovereignty of God. Jesus knew already he was going to raise him from the dead. I mean, that was already in God's will. It was God's plan. It's God's sovereign plan that Jesus would raise Lazarus from the dead. So Jesus knew that this was not the end for Lazarus, right? And so what does he say? It is good that I was not there. Now that you can see the glory of God, right? It's better that I was not there because if I was there, you'd have just hounded me and hounded me and hounded me till I took away a sickness. But it's better that he dies so I can raise him from the dead. What would be more impressive and more powerful of speaking to the power of God to cure a sickness or to raise the dead, right? That's much better, a much better illustration, a much better uh, view of God's glory to see Jesus raise Lazarus from the dead rather than just take away his sickness, right? And so there again, when we're looking at scripture, when you look at, and, and especially uh, Far Eastern or Eastern uh, uh, writings, when he says better than, doesn't mean the opposite is evil or bad. It just means there's it's better than. This is good, but this is better. Okay. So when we're reading this, we have to understand that, what he's saying here. Okay. A good name is better than precious ointment. Okay. He's not saying deodorant and perfumes are horrible. No, he's saying, please wear deodorant. Okay, wear perfume, wear whatever. Act, not Axe body spray. Let's let's avoid that. But you know, it's good to smell good. That's good. But he says better than that is a good name, right? What is he saying here? To live your life to glorify God, right? Deodorant and, and perfume, you have to reapply that over time. And if it goes away, you can't afford it or whatever, then you begin to stink, right? I mean, without it, you're no good. But he's saying with a good name. Ah, that's something that you continue to build over time as you look at your life. That's what Solomon's wanting us to do. He's wanting us to really examine our life. Okay. Do you have a good name? When people see you, when people hear your name, do they think of a godly person? Do they think of someone that, that, uh, that they want to be around, that they want to, uh, that they see as someone who could point them to Christ and, and, and better, uh, better off their life, right? What is your name? Uh, there again, I'm not talking about your physical name, Bill or Bob or Ted or Larry or Sue or whatever, right? He's talking about how you're identified in your walk with God. Or are you someone who people avoid uh, because you think you know it all or you're overbearing or you just uh, whatever your situation is? How are people reacting to you? Maybe you need to ask your friends. How do people see me? <laughs> Be honest with me. What is my name? What, how, what name do I have in my community, my family, my church, my workplace, right? And so he says there, a good name is better than precious one. But what are we focused on? The temporary things that, uh, you know, uh, being the best employee, but you may have a bad name. That's not good, right? So he says a good name is better than precious one. And the day of death than the day of birth. There again, the day of birth is a day of joy, right? We, we celebrate uh, birthdays. We're joyful whenever someone is born. Well, what about the day of death? He said there's value in that as well. Matter of fact, it's better because here's the thing is that when we go to the funeral, right? I mean, a lot of people avoid funerals. They avoid death. They avoid anything talking about it. Not that this uh, of funerals to be a complete celebration, but what do you do? You look at the life. It should be a reminder of the brevity of life, that we have a short lifespan. 
It may be 80 years or maybe 90 something years or maybe even 100 years or it may be 30 years. And so when we look and we go and we look at death, we look at the life of that person, that name that they had. And what have they done with it? It should be a wake up call to us that, that God has given us in his sovereign will a, sh- a short time span, a certain number of days. And what are we going to do with those days? What are we going to do with our life? Are we going to honor God? Or is it all going to be about us? The day of death than the day of birth, right? There again, we see the potential in a child that's born. We see the potential of what they could do with the day of death. We've seen what all they have done. Right. And so the day of death should be a day of, of recognizing that that um, uh, that this person has lived a life that honors God, hopefully, and has uh, loved others, hopefully, and all these things. And also what he's saying here is that for those of us in Christ, remember the day of birth, you're born into a sinful world. Uh, there again, we, we have the hope for the future of this child, but we don't know what the future is for this child. Maybe an early day, maybe cancer, maybe a uh, divorce, it may be war, maybe all these things. But the day of death, they're going on, if they are in Christ, they're going on to a future with Christ. And so there again, there's this changing of going from uh, the things of this earth into the things of eternity. And so the day of death, in a- essence, is a day of celebration, right? We mourn the death. We mourn the loss of the person. But the reality is, is that it's better for that person to be with the Lord. There is no more death, dying tears or, or wars or struggles, right? They're, they're in, if, if they're in Christ. Now, remember, this is all uh, if you're in Christ, not in Christ. There's judgment and there's hell awaiting. That's why the gospel is so important to, 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 to go and to, to share, because that day of death is the day of reckoning. And he's saying, listen, if you're in God, if you're in Christ, then the day of death is better than the day of birth. You're now with Christ. You're now in eternity with him. You're now in heaven. You're now with the one whose sovereign will has brought you to him. All right. So there again, how we view things in the sovereignty of God that this person is no longer here. And we lament that, that we don't have a relationship with them. but the reality in the sovereignty of God to, to, to save us, he's given us an opportunity to spend eternity with him. Go on verse two, it says, it is better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting. There again, there's, uh, what can you learn? Uh, and, 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 and these next few verses here, he's kind of giving these mourning, feasting, celebrating, you know, uh, sadness. Um, uh, it goes on the, um, uh, the house of feasting, the house of mourning, um, uh, sorrow, laughter, um, sadness and a uh, heart, uh, excuse me, the, um, the house of mourning, it goes back to the house of mirth. What, what is he saying there what, with all these verses, these contradictions that he's saying? He's saying, look, you know, life is not just a big joke. That's what he's trying to say, in essence, in the rest of these verses. Life is not just one big joke. Now, there again, I like a good comedy just like anybody else. Or anyone else, right? Um, you know, good comedy, television show or movie that's clean. Uh, love, love that, you know. Um, but here's the thing. Uh, you, you don't learn much from the comedy, right? It, it may entertain you and it may make you laugh. And there's good in laugh. God wants us to laugh, right? Uh, a good, clean comedy, right? Uh, he, we need to laugh and we need to enjoy life. Solomon has talked about that in Ecclesiastes. Enjoy life, right? But here's the thing is, is that if that's all you have, if all in your life you're trying to do is just laugh and laugh and have a good time, it's all about the party, and you don't get to the real heart of the issue of eternity, you don't get to the real heart issue of hurt and of pain and of lost, lostness, th- then you're not really living the full life. You're not living a wise life. You think life is a joke, right? You're not really focusing in on the, the, the reality of what God is doing in this world, that this world is not our home and it's not just a big joke for us to live through. And then we can deal with things seriously on a later time. No, we need to be serious about our faith. We need to be serious about our life. We need to be serious about the gospel. We need to be serious about our evangelism. We need to be serious about our church. Now, there again, church is not just to be a somber event where we come in looking like we went to a funeral to the house of mourning, right? But here's the thing is, is that there should be joy in the celebration of uh, the church gathering together. But in the reality of our sin, there should be a seriousness. There should be a mourning. There should be a uh, weeping. There should be a, a downcast heart knowing that we have sinned against a holy God. Right. So there again, there's this, this uh, balancing between the two. We're to have joy in Christ, but we're also to have mourning and lamenting of our sin. But we can't just all live there again of just going, oh, life is a big joke and let's just all have fun. 
Let's don't worry about the serious things. No, Solomon is saying, listen, wisdom, true wisdom that comes from God and understanding the sovereignty of God means we also need to examine the serious things of life. OK, so it goes on from there. Uh, be wise about choosing uh, how you walk. You're going to walk in wisdom or you're going to walk in folly. OK, how are you going to how are you going to walk? Right. So the first scene, scene one, those first few verses, kind of of a funeral setting. The second scene is of a fork in the road. There's a fork in the road. Which which how are you going to walk? We walk in wisdom or walk in folly. So look at verse five it says uh, it is better for a man to hear the rebuke of why of the wise than to hear the songs of fools. For as the crackling of thorns under a pot, so is the laughter of fools. And this also is vanity. Right. So are you listening to wisdom? Uh, he gives that illustration there, verse six, the crackling of thorns under a pot. You know, back in the, of course, we don't cook a, under a, over a fire much anymore these days unless you're camping. But if you just gathered thorns and you put them uh, to, to build, to, to cook your food, well, they 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 burst into flames real quick, right? They make a lot of noise, right? Um, but the thing is they don't last. You can't cook over them. You may have an instantaneous fire and it may last, uh, it may be hot for just a few seconds, but then it goes away. Sort of like a, a firework, right? Uh, a fire, you go to a fireworks illustration, it's entertaining, <laughs> you know, uh, boom, you, know, you get a, you see the sparkles and all this kind of stuff. It's entertaining, but when the show's over, the show's over, right? There's nothing lasting about it. And that's what he's saying is that who are you surrounding yourself with? Who are you listening to? Who has input into your life, right? Are you listening to people who uh, that, that you're surrounding yourself with that are just a bunch of fireworks? It sounds good, but it doesn't last, or it maybe is just uh, it, it's, it's surfacey things. There's no one there to to really dig into your life and to speak truth into your life. That's what it says in verse five. It's better for a man to hear the rebuke of the wise than to hear the song of fools. Well, there again, who are you listening to? Do you have someone in your life that can speak truth into your life, right? That's not just going to try to entertain you, but try to really make you a better person, make you a better person in Christ, right? Maybe not try to make you a better person as they see you need to be a better person, but a better person scripturally. Your walk with Christ. That's why we have small groups. That's why we want to gather together in small groups on Sunday school, whatever it may be, to, to, to pour into each other's life to where we can have an opportunity to, to make statements and be rebuked lovingly, not cast down, but say, well, hold on a second. Think about that. Is that, is that really how the Bible says or is that really what the truth is? Right. That's the rebuke of the wise. Not someone who cuts you down and cuts you off and casts you out. The rebuke of the wise is lovingly saying, I don't know about that. <laughs> you might want to look at scripture. Let's look, let's look at scripture together and see what this is about. That attitude that you have or how you're treating your family or your wife or how you're viewing your time with your family. Is that wise? Is that godly? You know, having someone that you can sit down with and, and, and really examine these things. Are you listening? There again, uh, what we input into our hearts and minds and our ears uh, be careful. Be careful what we listen to on television, even television preachers. My goodness. Uh, I can only think of a few that are good. The rest of them are no good. <laughs> right. Podcasts, and all these things. Are, who are you listening to? What music? What what entertainers? What uh, what politicians? Uh, what news? Uh, how are you metering how much you're hearing of those things? Right. Or is that all that you're hearing? So listen to the wise. He goes on to talk about um, the, the, the patient path and waiting wisely. So here's part of that walking in wisdom is patience, right? Look what he says in verse seven. Surely oppression drives the wise into madness and a bribe corrupts the heart. So he's talking about being patient in our, in our finances. You know, how many times do you, you know, I've, I've seen young couples that get into financial uh, trouble because they want what their parents have, but they want it at the age of 25. Well, if your parents are 50 and they've worked a long time, they have a house that's paid off uh, or close to it. They have nicer cars. They have a pool in the back. Backyard. They go on better vacations. Why? Because when you're 25, you're broke, right? But you can rack up those credit cards and um, and, and really be oppressed uh, because you want something right now. You want a better life right now. Well, wise and wisdom says, wait for God. God's sovereign. Remember, He will get you that promotion. He'll get you that raise. He'll get you whatever it is that He wants you to have, right? And it's God's sovereign will. God may want you to sell everything and and go on the mission field, like we saw in our mission moment last Sunday. You know, there again, are you living under the sovereignty of God and understanding God's sovereignty over your position in life? Verse eight, better it is, uh, excuse me, better is the end of a thing than its beginning. And the patient in spirit is better than the proud in spirit, right? It's, there again, it's talking about patience. 
being patient, understanding God's sovereignty. There again, we're to be working towards something. Remember what it says in the Psalms, your word is a light into my path, right? A, a light into my, uh, 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 yeah, light into my path, right? He's saying, look, stay in the word of God. God will direct you. He is sovereign. Stick with him. Be patient and God will bring about what God wants to do. Right. Verse uh, verse nine, be not quick in your spirit to become angry or uh, for anger lodges in the heart of fools. Right. So patient with circumstances. Right. Uh, OK. The other guy got the promotion and you did. You know, God is sovereign over that, too. Uh, God is sovereign over elections. Hopefully you won't get angry on November 3rd or who knows when they'll know when the, 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 who the president is. It may be not until January. Who knows? We don't know. But God does. We need to be patient, not angry. There again, I, you know, I, I see people get so angry about uh, political ads or whatever. Oh, he's lying. He's just a liar. You know, God knows that. Uh, anger has, is, is not fruitful. Right. None of knowing the truth. Now, if the truth is the person is lying, the truth is the truth. And you vote or whatever accordingly. But the thing is, is that you act like you have sovereign control over everyone else on Facebook and how they view something. You don't. You live your life under the sovereign rule of God. OK, verse 10. Say not, why were the former days better than these? For it is not from uh, not from wisdom that you ask this. Whoa. Now he's talking about nostalgia. Looking back, oh, the good old days. If we just be back in the good old days of when the church was this and that, the good old days when America was this and that, you know, what, what does he say there? Say not, where were the former, uh, why, why were the former days better than these? For it is not from wisdom that you ask this. Okay, that, again, you're living in the past. Now, we should learn from the past, but it doesn't mean we should live in the past, right? Nostalgia is a dangerous thing. Why? Because God has said, look, I'm doing something new. The church is, uh, the New Testament church is completely different than the Old Testament way of following God, right? We shouldn't go, man, I wish we had animal sacrifice again. Boy, those were the good old days. No, they weren't. No, Jesus Christ came and he walked on this earth. He went to a cross to die for us and we can see and live in his grace and mercy without having to go to a temple every week and offer a month or year and offer sacrifices for our sins and atonement. No, one has taken the atonement for us. The one final sacrifice. And so that's what Solomon is saying. If you're just living in the past, there's no wisdom in that. You learn from the past, but you don't live in the past, right? Our churches can't live in the past. And the, uh, one of the things I've heard many times is most of our churches, if 1950 ever comes around again, our churches are ready. Now we need to look at the future. God has a future. God is the God of the future. He wants us to move on, right? To look to him for guidance as we move on learning from our past, understanding our past, but yet moving on to new things, right? That's that's wise. That's wisdom is what Solomon says. Verse 11, wisdom is good. Uh, here's wisdom's value. Wisdom is good with an inheritance, an advantage to those who see the sun. In other words, those who are alive, right? For the Verse 12, for the protection of wisdom is like the protection of money. And the advantage of knowledge is that wisdom preserves the life of him who has it. There again, he's talking about the, the value of wisdom. Don't just live your life in folly and just, oh, it's just all, let's just all just have fun and let's all just, you know, laugh and carry on. Let's don't think about the serious things. Let's, you know, let's get everything we want right now. And so he's kind of summarizing all these proverbs. Look, there's, there's, you need to search, seek, seek out wisdom. Seek out God's wisdom, not just man's wisdom and finances. Those, those are good. We want to have good advisors. But here's the thing is, what's God's will? Are you seeking the one who truly knows? The financial advisor can only advise you so much. He doesn't know what the stock market is going to do in six months from now. Here's the thing is that God wants you to come to him and seek his wisdom because he is the one who who is truly sovereign. How do I raise my kids? Seek the Lord. How do we seek the Lord? In prayer and in his word. He's given us his word. So as I raise my children, how should I raise them? Seek God. Don't. I mean, there may be best-selling books on uh, New York best-selling, and they may be decent books or good books, but they're not the best book, right? The best way to do it is to raise our children according to God's word. How do I, uh, how do I, uh, uh, with my wife, my relationship with my wife. There's good Christian uh, books in the bookstores of how to have a good marriage. But the best thing is to seek God's will for our marriage. And hopefully those books are pointing to that, pointing you to God's will, right? The finances, our church, everything in life. We need to seek God's will through his word and through prayer to be transformed into the will of God, living in the will of God. And here's the, the conclusion, the epilogue, epilogue, if you will. 
Consider the work of God and trust him in your life. Consider the work of God and trust him in your life is what he's saying. Look at verse 13. He says, consider the work of God. Who can make straight what has been made crooked? Right. I mean, we live in a crooked world because of sin. Sin has come. And now we live in a crooked world. Who can make that straight? You can't. I can't. Only God can. God is the one who can make the crooked things straight. Verse 14, in the day of prosperity, be joyful. And in the day of adversity, consider God has made the one as well as the other so that man may not find out anything that will be after. What, what is Solomon saying there? He says, look, when there's times of joy. The time of birth, you celebrate. You have joy. Man, praise God for this new life that has come into the world. Be joyful. But also, here's the other thing. What does he say? In the day of adversity, in the day of, of hurt, in the day of downturn, whatever it is, uh, maybe it is the election, if that's the, every guy doesn't win, then what do you do? You consider God has made the one just like the other. God is sovereign over all of these things, right? It should give us confidence in God that he is the one. There again, um, I don't want this country to become a socialist country, but if it does in the next few years become a socialist country, we're no different than Colombia or excuse me, um, Venezuela, China, Cuba. You know what? God's still sovereign. That's the direction God wanted it to go. I don't know why. Doesn't matter. But I, you know, all, here's what I do know. God's still in control. God still has a church. God still has his son, Jesus Christ, and the gospel still needs to get to the world. So I'm going to worship God. And no matter what the circumstances are in joy or in adversity, God is still God. Right. That's what he's saying. Good and bad days will come. But God is always sovereign. Enjoy the good and persevere in the bad, trusting and thanking God in both. Right there again, I think this is very timely for uh, the next month we're going through. Uh, we got Supreme Court nominations and all these different things. We got an election coming up. We have all these things that we can get so tore up about and are, you know, are, 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 are you know, just uh, become angry about and we can become fretting and lose sleep over and all these things. Hey, listen, do your part. Vote. <laughs> do your part. But understand, you don't have sovereign control. I don't have sovereign control. The electoral college doesn't have sovereign control. God has sovereign control. No matter how the election turns out, no matter how the Supreme Court nomination turns out, no matter how COVID turns out, God is still in control. Now then, how are you going to live your life? Are you going to live your life assuming or trying to act like you have control and you're just tore up about whatever is, go is going on? Or are you going to live your life understanding that God has a will God is sovereign. He loves you. He loves you so much. He sent his son to die on a cross for you to take your sins and to bring you to him, to bring you to himself, to walk with you and to give you life. And that is who the God is that we serve. He is sovereign over all of these things. How can we sleep good at night? By the sovereign will of God, knowing that God is in charge, that God is the one who is in control. We worship him. We thank him for his sovereignty. Let us pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, once again, for your sovereignty, for your will. And Lord, we just pray that, that Father, we would uh, just give you, um, Lord, our hearts and our minds and our wills, all of these things, Lord, to be a part of what you are doing. Lord, we want to we be used by you. Lord, that goes against our very nature. We don't want to be used by anybody. But Lord, we want to be used by you because you are the one who knows all, who's created all, and has the end of all. Lord, we thank you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I pray this has been a blessing and I look forward to seeing you one week from tonight, next Wednesday, October 14th, 7 p.m. in the sanctuary, in the parking lot or video recorded. We'll talk to you then and until then, may God bless.